We have numerous conversations about throwing WhatsApp in the bush this round and using things like Telegram, regardless that it seems that legal types and pyramid schemes seem to favor the app. We also see people wanting to signal like Super Blue. But we're also very fortunate at this point in time to be joined by AI ethicists and data activists in residence at the University of Virginia, Renee Cummings. Now, Renee already had her first presentation for the year at the Winter ICT Educators Conference, and she made the official list in 2020 of the top 50 innovators. And she doesn't really, she isn't really a fan of all these Zoom meetings. So like I said, we are very fortunate to have her join us as we try to make some sense of data and artificial intelligence. Hello, Renee. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello, GK. Happy New Year. And of course, Happy New Year, Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you as well to you and yours. But question though, if data is the untold story as I've seen you describe it, what are some of the questions we need to be asking or factors we need to consider more? Well, I'll tell you this. The thing about data is every time you click and every time you share and every time you tag, that is being collected by an entity. And that entity is using that data to do something. Now, the untold story of data is the fact that many people believe because it is numbers, it is naturally objective, that it is uh, neutral, that science is neutral. But what we're realizing more and more with data is that data is very, very tricky in the sense that it, it carries with it a history. So particularly in the United States where you're seeing the application of new and emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, what we're seeing with the data is the data has packed into it many biases and many forms of discrimination and prejudice because this data was used somewhere before. And wherever it was used before, it is carrying a history. It's almost like DNA. It's like your genetics. So this data has a history, and that history has certain things that you've got to think about. Data as a power structure, how the data is collected, how it's classified, who's doing the collecting, who's doing the classifying, who's doing the annotations, who's doing the, the analysis of the data, what are they including, what are they excluding. So there's a certain measure of power and privilege that goes into the design or the application of every data set that eventually turns into a, a process, a policy, a product. So these are the questions that we've got to think about, the social, the cultural, the political context of data and how these things impact the long-term sociological impact of technology on society. Now, I like the fact that you speak about moving from the figures and those figures in being somewhere else, existing somewhere else before, but leading to policy. And that brings me to the question of using or weaponizing data. I'm not sure if weaponizing is too strong a word, but using that data to an end. At this point in time, many people are talking about monetizing this, monetizing that. Oh, when I say that, what are some of the things that immediately pop up to you, whether or not they're everyday examples or things from there you can extrapolate towards? All right, certainly. So my work at the University of Virginia, where I'm the uh, data activist in residence, particularly focuses on the weaponizing of data within the context of big data policing. So I've not stopped being a criminologist and a criminal psychologist. I've just really enhanced that with being an AI ethicist. So weaponizing data is this. Your data is being collected every day. And that data is not only being monetized and you're not getting anything uh, from the profits, but that data is also being weaponized against you, particular black and brown people. So when you see technologies as controversial as facial recognition, big data policing, which uses predictive analytics to create these boxes on these maps and, and put police officers in there or put what we call our cops on dots. Uh, when you're looking at certain surveillance technologies and certain sensor technologies that are being deployed, particularly in communities of color in the United States and, and of course internationally, what we're realizing is the same data that these big uh, companies, big tech, is collecting from individuals is the same data they are now using to arrest you. So some of my work as a data activist looks at mass surveillance, looks at big data policing, looks at things right now that people aren't thinking about, like a digital arrest or geofencing warrant or geolocation subpoenas. These are all things that are happening in law enforcement now, where law enforcement could access your data from a big tech company or from any provider 
and you can become a person of interest to law enforcement by just being in a particular area at a particular time because your data is part of the location in which they are looking at. So the weaponizing of data means that data could be used against you as a weapon against you, particularly diverse communities, particularly uh, people of color. And it's really critical. So my work as an AI ethicist looks at things like making big tech more accountable and more transparent and explaining to individuals how their data is being used. There is this misconception. A lot of people believe that we are consumers of data, but no, we are producers of the data. And if your data is being used, there are things that you need to pay attention to. You have to ensure that your data is not being used to create any harm, and in the worst case, harm against you, but you've also got to ensure that privacy and security, these things are critical to the ways in which your data is being used. And whether or not you have given these companies the permission, but what happens to many of us is when we get a new phone or we are uh, you know, putting a new application on our phone, uh, we see all of these things and we just click, 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 and we agree right to the end because we just want to get up on the, the platform or just use the technology. But you've got to start thinking about that. So in my work, I think about it a lot because in the criminal justice system in the United States, the application of algorithms. And algorithms is, you know, it's like the, the lifeblood of, of big data. And what we're seeing is that algorithms are being used to create these risk assessment tools that inform arrest and sentencing and corrections and rehabilitation and, and whether or not you are seen as a risk. So we have situations right now where people are ready for parole and they cannot be paroled because an algorithm an algorithm, right? Think about it, data is saying that we should not allow this person to be released. But now, because we know the untold story of the, the data, we can realize that, wait a minute, this data could be inherently racist or inherently biased or inherently discriminatory because the data has a past. And when you look at criminal justice data in particular in the United States, it is very, very troubling and, and very, very complex and really cannot be taken at face value. Now, we have about one and a half minutes before we get to the break, but even before we get to big data, do are we ourselves culpable to some level by what it is we do? Many times people talk about work is supposed to be work, but because some of these lines are blending and merging and there are more gray areas than there used to be in terms of black and white, uh, are we putting ourselves in situations that we should be avoiding or we should be thinking about a little more? So once you're existing in 2021, you are using technology. And once you're using technology, data is a big question because technology is all about data. That's what it's about. So you can get away from it because you want to access certain services. So if you use any social media platform, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, if you use Amazon, if you're doing online shopping, your data has already been collected. A profile has already been made, uh, made for you. And a company could use that to monetize or they can use that to weaponize. But you've got to be aware. So some of the work I do as an AI ethicist is about advocacy and activism and evangelism. So it's about educating people when it comes to the use of their data and letting them know what their options are and letting them know the things that they need to think about and the things that they really need to process before they decide to put their data out there. And because of COVID-19, uh, data is, is probably, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's being called AI expansionism because there are so many things happening with healthcare now that you've got to think about when it comes to your data. So much to think about, so much to talk about. We continue this conversation. When we return, we are speaking with Rene Cummings. Stay with us. Welcome back. We are speaking with Renee Cummings. Many titles to her name, but we right now we're going with AI ethicist and data activist uh, in residence at the University of Virginia. And one of the things that you were speaking about, Renee, in terms of trying to educate people, trying to sensitize people. Now, as uh, while you're in residence, what are some of the things that you're working towards that would be markers of success for you? Say, okay, well, this time was well spent because I was able to achieve 
this? What's, what's that? Sure. So I'm actually working on a, on a project that is uh, really about pushback. And what this project allows you to do is when you move through any community, any city, any state, you're able to use an app that really allows you to see the kind of algorithmic force or digital force that's being applied against you. Because every time you go into a particular space in the United States, you have probably been captured on about 40 cameras as soon as you step out of your house. So uh, there's something called uh, Big Brother uh, cameras, right? So those are the cameras that uh, uh, buildings would have, uh, private residences would have, and then you have the public ones that are out there. But there are other things that are being used when it comes to mass surveillance when it comes to being able to check your license plates and, and capturing your license plates once you cross a bridge or once you enter a toll area anywhere in the United States. And so there's just so many different pieces of technology that are out there. All of this is capturing your information. So my cr most critical, I think my uh, most critical contribution will be uh, giving members of any community the ability to see how their data is being captured, how it could be used by your law enforcement, and really providing a requisite level of pushback, which is necessary. Because this technology is so new and because uh, technology is always light years ahead of the law, the legal system is really not there yet. So much of my work is about uh, bringing that level of advocacy to the public, uh, working with the communities in uh, Charlottesville to help build this tool, which includes working with Charlottesville law enforcement as well, and, and really trying to bring a piece of technology that speaks to, to your privacy, to your rights, to your security, that ability to, uh, you know, of course, uh, say who uses your data and where your use data is being used, and to really um, educate you on what's the digital arrest. Because what we're seeing right now with algorithmic force as it uh, pertains to big data policing is that police powers are expanding and extending you know, in, in a way that people are not paying attention to. So although I am committed to uh, you know, professional policing and I'm still committed to doing a lot of work with law enforcement, I'm also committed to justice. And most critical aspect of policing is procedural justice, which means there must be a due diligence in the work that they're doing. There must be a certain respect for duty of care and due process must never be stepped on because it is about justice. So much of my work is about social activism and it's about empowering citizens, in this case, uh, US citizens to uh, ensure that they're able to protect themselves in the ways in which their data is being used by law enforcement. And all that you're saying right now, and it just carried me back to a point that you made a little earlier, that many of the things that are created show or give an idea into the mindset of the person who would have created them. So you also spoke about if you're in 2020 or you've survived 2020, we're in 2021 now, that means that you're interacting with a lot of these systems in a more, uh, on a more consistent basis. So with that in mind, though, I want to ask for advice to persons who are forced to have these kind of interactions with more intensity on the digital landscape, maybe a personal or professional level. And I also put that in that question in the context of you saying that some of the greatest designers of these regulations and frameworks are also some of the greatest perpetrators of unethical behavior. So what kind of advice would you have for us who are trying to interact with these things willingly or unwillingly? Right. So I guess, um, and you know, that's a, a quote from uh, an article in which I was featured in the UK. And yes, what we've seen is big tech create these fantastic frameworks, uh, these cr fantastic ethical guidelines, and then they come and they perpetrate and, and, and they just break those the guidelines and do what they want to do. If you're using data and we all are using data, there are great things about data. Uh, Artificial intelligence is the area in which I work, and I am very passionate about that technology, its uh, potential, its, its promise, and, and it's just, it's very powerful. But it is also a technology that can create a lot of damage if we don't have those ethical guardrails in place to guide the work of, of new and emerging technologists. If you are using data and you are using data, if you have any kind of smartphone in your hand, your data is being collected. Just pay attention to these privacy um, 
notifications, know that you have the option to opt out, even if you opt into some sort of technology, understand the power of your data and really make wise and responsible decisions when it comes to the things that you are sharing. Also understand that law enforcement uh, is changing in the ways in which it is using data. This may have not arrived to TNT yet, so you may be lucky, but in the United States, the most critical thing that I'm looking at right now is that digital arrest where you've been arrested by your data and you are yet to know. So it's something that you want to think about. If you work in the field of technology in which I am working right now, I just want you to think about how you use those data sets, the power you have if you are data analysts or if you are data scientists or you're some sort of technologist designing. Uh, look across the life cycle of whatever you're designing and ensure that diversity, equity, and inclusion is critical is a critical part of the work that you're doing. We've got to think about the ways in which data is further marginalizing groups and communities, and we've got to use data to empower people. So uh, my thing is let's not use data to disenfranchise, which is something that we're seeing right now. And if we bring it back to um, even the US election, some of the work that I do is in the media manipulation of data, looking at things like disinformation, deep fakes, and how that level of disinformation can create issues of trust, issues of accountability. And what we're seeing right now, how disinformation can turn into something like violence in real time. So there's much to think about. So just stay relevant because you are using data. And I always say, just take your mind a little further because it's important just to protect yourself as well. And I like the fact that you talk about consumption of media and looking at things that may be a little biased. No. And many times we like to say it's them, it's their fault. But what about personal culpability in terms of personal co consumption of data uh, or culpability for actions informed by algori algorithms that may be biased or there's the term fake news that has been bandied about. But how do we say, okay, well, this is how I filter and well, this is how know, I make these decisions? I always say um, the most critical thing about AI is one, we need to have AI literacy from early education because what you want to do is build some sort of ethical resilience in young people coming up. The other thing that you've got to do is look at the things that you're sharing. You know, sometimes someone sends us something and we start sharing this and sending it to everyone in our contact list. If that information is not uh, backed up by three other sources somewhere on the internet, it means that it's not real. Anyone can create anything and put anything out there. But what we're seeing is the need for more media literacy or social media literacy, because sometimes people get something and they just believe that this is real. Sometimes there are websites that look real, look like official news, and it is not official news. And there are things like troll farms and click farms. There are people sitting right now in Thailand and in Afri all parts of Africa and all parts of Asia whose job every day it is to troll on social media, to click. There's something called positive trolling where you come and you see something and about a million people have liked it and you're like, okay, this has got to be the real deal. Many times it is not the real deal. There are many agendas out there and now we're seeing the danger the danger of conspiracy theories at the highest level and people believing things that are not true. So as we move into 2021, one of the biggest or the most critical areas of technology is going to be its ability to manipulate truth. People are going to have problems differentiating. We already have problems differentiating when it comes to those apps that people use. And you sometimes see someone in social media and then you see them in real life and you're like, okay, what happened between Facebook and the street, right? So we see that there's an ability to use technology to enhance in critical ways, but understand that ability to change what is real also applies to the content and the information that you are consuming. And what is real is that we're out of time, definitely. This is something. It's always nice to have people invite you back. So thank you very much for whetting our appetites, Renee, Renee Cummings. And on behalf of the entire news team, I'm DK Rosta. Thank you for joining us. Have a good night. <laughs>